Okay, now the next thing I want to talk about is the five chord in a minor blues. Okay, this G7. We're going to use a chord. I'm going to use terminology from when I was growing up because that way I won't make a mistake sharing. Uh, sometimes I have to think about the new terminology or the new way people are looking at things and it can and then I might be saying what I mean but telling you something weird. So I'm going to stick to what was really prom, uh, prevalent when I was growing up and that is what we used to call the altered chord. The altered chord is basically a dominant chord and it is a chord that has all of the tensions altered. Now it comes from several different places, it has its own theory, it has this and that, so please don't get sidetracked, let's stay just on what we're doing right here. We're going to put an altered chord in our minor blues, and then in other places at other times I'll really unpack the theory for you, but for today. The altered chord is what we say all available tensions are altered. What are the available tensions in a chord? So if you're looking at this as a G7, one, three, five, seven. Those are the chord tones. The tensions, and some people actually call seven, flat seven, a tension to create this triad. But we're calling these the chord tones. One, three, five, seven. Eight, nine, ten, or three, eleven, twelve, thirteen. That's it. Those are the notes that you can put on a G7. Those are the available tensions. Nine, eleven, and thirteen. We can alter these, and we alter them to make them fit minor harmony. And so here are the altered tensions. We can have 9 is a flat 9. We can have 11 sharped. And we can have 13 flatted. If we flat 11, it becomes 3, so it's not an altered tension, it's a chord tone. However, if we take D and we call it flat 5, then we can have this as an altered note. So flat 5 and sharp 11 can actually be the same note. Uh, that's worth mentioning, and that's one of the reasons why I'm sticking to the altered terminology, because then we don't get too far away from our goal, and that's to be able to play a blues. So here are, again, flat 9, sharp 11, or flat 5, and then flat 13. Now, the wonderful thing about altered is, if you have flat 9, it implies that sharp 9 is available. A sharp 9 would be the B flat. And uh, George Gershwin did a pretty famous thing with that here. So I don't want to get ahead of myself with the tritone substitution, but we're getting there. So there it is. Now, we have this seven chord here with all the available tensions. And so now we've got to figure out how do we get all of that into a nice voicing so I can have some finger movement. So for our purposes, we're going to bring everything down here first. So I'm going to get this flat 13 down here. I'm going to put seven on the bottom and I'm going to put 3 here. Now I could, if I wanted to, put flat 9 there, or I could put sharp 9 there. Can, you can see that. I got everything down into one hand. 
I could do this. And the most important thing is that you've got to reach down and play a G once in a while so that you hear that's what you're playing. So now my C blues So those notes, those are really nice colors. I'm playing the notes of the G. You can rewind this if you need to. could have, if you just had this, one, three, five, seven, and then sharp that five, you would call this a G7 augmented. The wonderful thing about jazz in the 70s with fake books and lead sheets and going on gigs and not knowing a lot of tunes, when you got to the augmented chord, you could play the altered sound and it always worked. It brought more color than the augmented was asking. So in a tom uh, augmented, a lot of times you can use a whole tone scale. But it kind of sends you in a different direction than the minor sounds. And so that's something you use uh, at another time. We might talk about that. But for our purposes, being able to put that altered color in, it might say, the, the chord might say G augmented and the uh, standard way of dealing with that would be to put in the altered voicing. So you could just do these three notes. There's seven, three, there's our guide tones, and then a flat 13. I can play flat nine with my right hand, sharp nine, or I could play sharp 11, or I could play all three. And get some really great sounds. G, and I've got a really powerful sound there. So then the last thing on this discussion I definitely have to get to you, even though it's not a blues scale, it's an amazing scale, and it's called the Altered Scale. Now, it's also called Super Locrian, and it's called a couple other things too, but I'm sticking to the altered scale, so we keep our terminology. In later videos, you're going to hear me say altered chord, altered this, altered scale, and that's how we're going to be referring to it, so you won't have to get confused. Um, and if I do say Super Locrian, I'll qualify it and say, well, actually, I meant altered. So here's our altered chord, here's our altered scale. The altered scale has the notes of the altered tensions. So basically we have flat nine, sharp nine, there's our third, there's our flat five or sharp eleven, and then we have our sharp five or flat thirteen, and then seven and then one. It's a great scale. Sounds wonderful. Fingering. C scale fingering. Anytime you can't use the basic fingering, I will always tell you alternate fingerings to use. But in this case, this is one of those wonderful situations where the scale we're using the same fingering that's trained into your hand if you've learned a C scale. And you'll notice if you look at it that we've got a little bit of a hybrid of the harmonic minor and the pure minor. So here, pure minor going up, 
good there. There's our harmonic minor. And then we have this note's out, so we don't crash into it. It's replaced by that. We've, the fifth is in our chord. So there's a little bit of a hybrid of both of them. That's not the, um, the formation of the scale. That's just a fact. That's a kind of a neat little idea. If you look at it like, whoa, there's a lot of both of those there. And that's why it works. So we have this. C2, whoa, there's an E flat triad. Now, in another place, they're talking about triad pairs and this, that, and the other thing. And again, it's all about building licks and sticking things together and then finding a place to cram it in. We're not doing that together, you and I. What we're doing is we're learning the language of music and the reason things are there so that we can use them to speak with. So there's an E-flat triad that emerges from this altered scale. And there are others as well that I will talk about in another place. But for right here, the reason I'm targeting that E-flat is because that's what we can use as common tones or common sounds that go with our C minor blues. So here's our C minor blues, and we can use an E flat triad over that because it's part of it. Relative major, relative minor. Okay, then we can go to F minor. Here's nine, and here's 11. Nice note, part of the blues scale. nine and eleven and that gives us the E flat triad and of course we just discovered the E flat triad here and then we have our C minor so if I use the E flat triad I'm gonna take first inversion so I can use flat fingers and you can see it It's a simple idea, but you could see there's a lot of potential there. What if we use our blues scale? Notice at the end I started switching into the harmonic minor option, or you might say I was just targeting the third of the G and the fifth, because it sounds really great as notes to get in and out of. There is a melodic minor scale. I'm not going into that now because there's a whole uh, theory that goes with melodic minor that's wonderful, and I'm trying to keep us focused on the use of relative major, relative minor interchange. And that's what, again, we're dealing with here with the E flat, the C minor. And so then these are the ways we can play some really great sounds. I could have also used that altered scale.
is how I went up there. Whoops. And here I was going to go to the C minor. So I switched the scale so it would sound nice and inside and make sense to you. Later, I might not be so worried about that. But for now, trying to be consistent with chord tones and sounds. And you'll also notice that I'm hitting the root on a lot of these and it just doesn't sound that bad. It sounds like a jazz lick. That's why I wanted to share it. It sounds like a run, just doing the straight scale. This is a bebop thing. Note, note, inner note. Upper neighbor, lower neighbor, <laughs> lower neighbor, and then this. That's a bebop thing. It's a classical thing. as you play. I'm never analyzing when I listen to music. I know people who sit and listen and are thinking, wow, he played sharp 11 there, and then he went to sharp, and then he went to this, and then he did that, and then, oh, that was a nice, sub and then he did a tritone thing. Here, I, I listen to music, and if it moves me, I want to know what's going on. But if it doesn't move me, I don't care. So I'm not listening for the theory or the delivery of the guy's um, theory or his chops. I'm listening to the sound and the music. So for an improvising place, you're learning the theory, then you're applying it, then you stop thinking about the theory and you just go by the sounds that you discovered when you were studying the theory. And so you end up being at a place where you kind of forget everything you learned when you're actually playing. So it's a wonderful process, and it's nice because then you don't really ever stay up here in the head. You're always in here in the heart and the soul. Uh, that's what Charlie Parker meant when he said, learn the changes, then forget them. It's that process right there. So a good place to stop, and let's regroup and see what else we can do with C minor before we go back to our regular blues. See you next time.